Hey everyone, this is John Fennick with the Fennick Commodities Report, and with me today is Ty Doherty, who is CEO of First Tellurium, a uh, stock that I just got familiar with this year, and I thought it would be timely to bring him on. Um, Ty, welcome to the show. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, John. Of course. So Ty, you know, um, obviously I've got an interest in the critical mineral space. Um, I'm an advisor to the Washington DC conference that's happening in April of next year um, about energy transition and critical minerals like tellurium. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on what tellurium is, why it's critical and you know how your company can help investors. Yeah, no problem, John. Thank you for asking me. Uh, well, for th th those in the audience that aren't aware of it, uh, tellurium is one of the rarest metals on the planet. It's the eighth or ninth rarest metal in the world. Same same scarcity as platinum, so to speak. And it's sort of come into its own about oh, 30 years or so ago when a company in the U.S., First Solar, used it as part of their mixture for their solar panels, a cadmium tellurium mixture. And obviously with uh, green energy going forward, it's uh, had a big impact and their company is growing and as their CEO said about a year and a half ago, that you know they're looking for more and more tellurium as we speak. And fortunately for ourselves, not necessarily fortunately for them, is there's a scarcity of it. So people that have tellurium like ourselves, and we're the only junior out there that I'm aware of that has a focus on, on tellurium, people have to come knocking to our door. But what's also come to our advantage in the last little while is that about a year and a half ago, and John, you'll have, to, you'll have to excuse me. I always go back to a year and a half ago or a year. I'm not sure of the exact dates, but it's all public. Uh, the University sure. of British Columbia up here in Canada uh, worked with a company called Phoenix Advanced Material, who are partners with us. And they uh, they uh, filed for patent a lithium tellurium battery, which uh, I've been told is far superior to a lithium ion battery. So um, th there's five basic advantages from the lithium uh, tellurium battery over lithium ion battery. And for those people that uh, don't think that batteries and green energy are, are the future, what we're looking for, they should probably turn off this interview and go somewhere else. But for those who understand the green energy and batteries, uh, the five advantages to the lithium tellurium over lithium ion are number one, much more powerful, four to 10 times more powerful. Number two, much easier to charge. Number three, lasts twice as long and size wise. So let's say, I don't know if you see my hand here, but here's the you know size of a lithium ion battery for a car, for example, okay? And here's the size of a lithium tellurium battery, which again has all these other advantages. You can measure between the thumb and forefinger. So, you know, that obviously asks the question, well, how important is that gonna be for automobiles and airplanes and other uh, modes of transportation? And the fifth and final advantage, which is probably one of the most important, if not the most important, is the fact that it's a solid state battery, John, which means it cannot catch fire. Lithium right. ion batteries can and do catch fire, as we've seen in the news recently. I think it was a couple months ago, the freighter from Holland with 3,000 luxury vehicles on it. A couple of them caught fire and they all ended up at the bottom of the Atlantic. And it's not the first time that's happened. So we had that advantage. So as I, I say to people, if there was no other advantage between a lithium tellurium and a lithium ion, other than the fact that it's a solid state won't catch fire, I said at the very least, I think uh, insurance companies and automobile companies would uh, certainly be interested in finding what that's all about. So what that does for us is that those are two major uh, developments going forward. You know, obviously the solar panels have been around for a while, but you know, the lithium batteries have been going on for, I don't know, it's like six or seven years now. And I don't think it's going to slow down. So if we can show people that we have a better battery, then I think that puts us in the forefront because, you know, anyone that's looking for, for uh, tellurium, you know, they're obviously going to Google and say, well, who's got it? And we're it, you know, we're first tellurium. We named ourselves for a reason. And as of now, I joke, we should call ourselves first and only. Uh, but well, we did that strategically, you know, and what is most interesting about it, I should say the most interesting, I'll let the viewers decide that. But uh, when it comes to the potential of our of our company going forward, if tellurium went to zero, the price of tellurium went to zero, which is not going to happen. But if it did, it would have a very minor effect on the on our cash balance going forward when we get into production, because as of now, it represented about five to 10 percent of our future payload. But that does not include this new copper porphyry we discovered, which could have a, obviously an overwhelming effect on the potential financial benefits of the company. But setting that aside for now, and, and of course, it's not easy to set aside a copper porphyry, but for these purposes, we'll, we'll discuss it. it you know, uh, the, the, our Deerhorn property in Canada has got a, a high-grade gold-silver tellurium uh, property, basically on surface. And our PEA uh, preliminary economic assessment report that we did in uh, 2018 
the independent engineer said we average grade was a little over five grams of gold per ton. And as I stress to people, that's not 0.5. That's five grams of gold per ton. I think it was 157 grams of silver and I think 160 parts per million tellurium, which is considered rich. And, uh, you know, our PEA that we did was based on only 20% of the known zone uh, at that time. And since then, we've expanded that zone from 2.4 kilometers to uh, almost 50% is a uh, 3.5 kilometers. And that's just the gold silver zone. And then recently, if you look at our news release, I think we put out two weeks ago, that this new copper discovery that made the copper porphyry, our, uh, our um, qualified person, Dr. Lee Grote, who's a professor at UBC and world famous. He also uh, works for the governments of Japan and India, consults to them, so he's known worldwide. Uh, he said that it looks like the gold, silver, tellurium zone and the, and the copper porphyry are all connected as one zone. And we just announced, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, we put, I think it was a week ago, put out some beautiful pictures of uh, bornite on, on the surface of the property, which is high grade uh, copper. And he said uh, that our mineralized zones go for seven for 17.5 square kilometers, which I was blown away from. That's that's huge. You know, so it's just a matter of how we proceed with it, how we go forward. But I always say that, you know, as I said to the shareholders that, you know, uh, I sold my last company uh, for people that may not know, I picked up a company called Quinto Mining and had a market cap of $4 million. And I was lucky enough to sell it 11 years later for $175 million. But instead of taking the cash, we took shares in the company. So we ended up owning about 20 to 21% of a company called Consolidate Thompson Iron Mines. And they got sold two and a half years later for 4.9 billion. And that's with a B. So our enterprise value was, was around a billion dollars. So you know, I was basically yeah. retired and these opportunities came. But as I say to my shareholders, my gut feeling, and it's just my gut feeling, uh, you know, it's not the corporate point of view, but my gut feeling is that someone's going to come and buy us out in, in a couple of years before we do too much damage on a, expanding the zones uh, as much as we can, because anyone that needs tellurium better get it soon, because 60%, uh, that's 60% of the tellurium supply to the United States comes from China. And as we all know that right. there's going to be some uh, trade wars going on, and President Biden has said he wants to have domestic supplies or and or supplies from friendly countries, which obviously we have this property in British Columbia, but we also have a phenomenal high grade property in Colorado, which we can talk later on. So we're well positioned because, you know, we're going to have some nice gold now with this new zone it could be interesting, but no, none of the big gold companies are going to circle and say, Hey, well, you may have a million, two million, whatever the number is going to be, but people that need to learn, we're going to have to come to the table to get it because, uh, you know, first solar, did a report back in 2012 in Cologne, Germany, talking about four potential suppliers of tellurium down the road. One was in China, one was in Mexico, one was in Sweden, and one was ourselves. And at the conference, they say they don't trust China, they don't trust Mexico. So that left Sweden and ourselves. And the Swedish company sold all of their tellurium within a, a year, year and a half. I don't know to whom. I'm guessing for sold, but I don't know that to be the fact. So that leaves us as the only one there. And then you couple that with this phenomenal property. I think they were trying to keep secret in Colorado which blows our, our grades of tellurium out of the water. We're high grade in Canada, but this, it's another level. So we're feeling very comfortable. And, and the worst case scenario, and it's not a worst case at all, but okay, if we don't get an offer that we like, then we hire the right people and put in production ourselves. So I learned my, the last company, the best time to sell something, John, is when you don't have to. And the negotiations right. for the negotiations for Quinto took all of 10 minutes. We were at the Masters Golf Tournament. They made a, they made a proposal, I countered, we shook hands and that was it. And the rest is history, so to speak. So we're sitting on some wonderful situations and having minerals that are great for the green energy, for the critical metals. Um, I don't think it could be uh, good ask for too much more than we have. That's great. Well, right on point there um, with the timing and I uh, appreciate that. So let me ask a couple of questions and then well, after that, we'll see if uh, you know any of the listeners have some questions to follow up. So you know, to unpack that news you just talked about last week, um, I saw that you went to 17.5 kilometers of mineralization. What was the number prior to that? So you said you were excited about the news. Like how much did it grow? Well, the number before that, we never actually connected it. We thought there were two separate zones. Like the, the gold, silver, tellurium zone was originally 2.4 kilometers. So I'm thinking for the American audience, one and a half miles, I think approximately. And we knew there was some previous work done up to the north of us, but we didn't know they were connected. 
So um, Dr. Grote uh, walked the property uh, last year and, and increased it by uh, almost 50% to 3.5 kilometers, him and, and my chairman, Tony, and the driller. And then with the work they did this summer, we, we got an uh, induced polarization uh, company came in and did some work. We're waiting to get those results, hopefully in four to five weeks. So we see what's under the surface. Uh, we don't have much doubt what's under there because porphyries don't uh, go to a depth of one foot only, right? You know, so we're pretty excited about that. And then uh, with the previous work we uh, with the with the Dr. Groats uh, PhD students uh, from UBC and a couple of other guests from uh, St. Andrews University in Scotland came, uh, spent four or five weeks up on the property go, looking at rock samples and soil samples, and basically we have connected the two zones. So uh, that's why we come and say 17 and a half square kilometers, which. Uh, and by the way, that's not the limit of the property. That's just what they've seen now. So, uh, you know, right. normally, you know, when, when I had my previous company, it was like, uh, you know, strike length was a couple of kilometers and that was it. But now you got the, you know, three and a half uh, kilometers one direction and five kilometers the other direction and still open, you know, so it, it's it's very, very exciting. And the problem I've had, uh, I shouldn't say the problem, uh, the um, the roadblock I have to have with most investors, and I'm glad you give me the opportunity because when I've spoken with you, you actually understand what we're doing, is that when people look and say, oh, no, no, this can't be true because if this was true, it'd be trading at multiples of where it's at. And that's the biggest thing you have. Like with Quinto, we had a couple of very interesting uh, properties in the company and the people, and we had, you know, we're trading 18 or 20 cents at the time. And, you know, the so-called armchair quarterback, the experts say, well, no, it can't be true because if it was, it'd be higher. So all it takes is for one group to find out who you are and my attitude has always been, John, first of all, to the audience, I'm not a geologist or an engineer. I'm just an entrepreneur, a businessman that's made a little bit of money. And I like to surround myself with really bright people. So you look on my, sure. on my, on my advisory board, I've got four gentlemen that used to be involved with First Solar, which obviously is our solar side. And then we have uh, Don Freshy, who's the CEO of Phoenix Advanced Material, who are one of the top uh, ultra high purity metal manufacturers in the world. They do 6N and 7N technology. And he's the one that's got a, a working with the patent with the UBC on this lithium tellurium battery. So we got the battery side taken care of. So I like to surround myself. So, and, you know, the gold, silver, copper, that sort of speaks for itself. We don't really need experts on that. But I like to surround myself with people like uh, like Dr. Grote and all that. So, you know, they just tell me hey, what's going on. And if it's bad news, but thankfully it hasn't been, you know, just tell me the stuff and we'll work from there. Just don't give me all the, you know, the wonderful rosy stuff. Just tell me what it is. And we're big, big enough and old enough to figure out what to do. So. Luckily, we've had this opportunity. And what I should say to the to the people that question, you know, uh, how come no one's done it before is we have to understand, like, with the deer horn, it's up, a, we're up a mountain. Okay, mm -hmm. and up the, historically, it was covered in snow and ice until the last 12, 10, 20 years or so, thanks to Mother Nature and global warming. Before that, it was eight feet of snow year round. So no one would have ever mm -hmm. saw this unless they went up there with, uh, you know, a sheep in the summertime and and rode them around but so we're very fortunate and i've learned in my, in my in my past life not past life my past experience is that it's better to be lucky than good you know in quinto we were very lucky and some of some of that is based on uh you know the 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 analysts and all that not doing their research or whatever the case is or you know it's too good to be true and to say and that's good because for people like me say great there's opportunity here because if we, as I say, if this property was on the side of a highway or something, this it, this would have been scooped up 50, 60, 70 years ago, and I wouldn't have had these opportunities. So I look at sure. it this way, and we're sitting on a phenomenal property, and there's so many stories, what's going on behind the scenes and other opportunities for us, like thermoelectric. You know, we own 51% of a company because we think uh, that new invention, if it gets to, uh, we patent it, could have a huge effect on the solar industry and the automobile industry. So, um, you know, for anyone that, that asked me, you know, can you tell a story in 10 minutes? Uh, no, I can't. You know, I can tell the partial story. And uh, that's why I talk really fast, John. I'm trying to get everything in and people can slow it down later on. But it's just, uh, you know, it's a great story. And just to let people know this is verifiable. I'm the largest shareholder. I don't sell. You know, you can check the insider reports. Matter of fact, I bought another 50,000 shares last week off the market. I bought a million shares in this private placement that we're doing i'll probably end up buying more uh, you know as we go along and my wife's a big shareholder too because you know that's how we made our money before it's a real deal and uh, and we go from there i noticed on the website that you've got 86 million shares out and about 120 fully diluted so what of you know what if i don't if you don't mind me asking what kind of a position do you and your family have um in, in percentage terms well i think percentage wise now that i think this 
I, my CFO was telling me the other day, this million shares that I bought, not including the other one uh, on the private placement, hasn't been filed. It hasn't closed yet. But she said that puts me over 10% just myself personally. And my wife and my wife and son I combined, I think they're probably about three or 4%. And then with all the warrants we have outstanding, it would probably be somewhere about 20% or 21, something like that. You know, and, I'm, and I will be adding more. You know, because we're sitting, it's, it's a wonderful situation. And like I, what I was going to say earlier about, I expect to get bought out. It, 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 it's an opportunity for us. And I do things like the movie Field of Dreams. You know, the old thing, if you build it, they will come. And this is what I do with companies. We build it properly. And the big boys with real checks that don't bounce show up. And, you know, I have the odd person say, well, what's your share structure? And I'll say, for the people that just want to flip their stock, yeah, share structures are, uh, is one of the things they look at. But you know, people don't buy you for your share structure. They, they buy you for your ounces in the ground, your tons in the ground, your your kilos in the ground. And that's how we do it. And that's why I, I think I've, I've said to people that some people might find me a bit arrogant, and I hope they don't, but I just know what I'm sitting on. And uh, I, unfortunately, in, the, in these bad times for junior markets, a lot of these other companies, they're sort of at the whim of all these investors, like, you know, take it on my terms, or I'm not going to give you anything. Well, you know, I made a little bit of money so I can keep it going. And, you know, I don't have a huge overhead. I don't have an office in downtown Vancouver. I'm two suburbs south, and uh, I have a two and a half person operation, just like I did when I sold Quinto. So if times get a little tough, well, then we just cut back a bit and don't have wither on the vine like some of these guys that have $20,000 a month rent and, you know, three secretaries walking around and, Vice president's like, no, no, no. My money goes into the ground. I don't need that wearing a hat saying, aren't I wonderful? People can figure it out. That's great. I mean, I think one of the challenges with junior mining is, is timing. Like you said, luck does matter because people have conviction. CEOs have conviction in what they're doing, but they may have, you know, used all their powder, so to speak, uh, earlier this year, last year. I mean, it's easy to make that mistake. And then sit around and not have the ability to do what you and your family have done, which is buy up a lot of shares. And clearly, you've got a, a track record of success at Quinto with with uh, as if I get these numbers correct, you you said you put four million or so in and and exited for one seventy five. Yeah, it was four million. The market cap was four million when I took it over. Okay. Yeah, and then we got sold out one seventy five. As I mentioned, the negotiations took all of ten minutes, and that included you want to refill, right? So it just it just makes sense. And and I was basically semi retired, thinking, okay, what are you gonna, what am I gonna do? Because mining's too tough, as you know. But when you get properties like this dropped in your lap, it's kind of like, wow, this is this is unbelievable. But I did say to my wife because I spent eleven years at Quinto. I said, okay, honey, I'm not gonna spend. It won't take another eleven years. Now it's fifteen, but so on and so forth. But you know, you can imagine, John, and for the audience, I mean. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes or Columbo to figure out what's going on. So, you know, we don't put out uh, news ahead of time like some guys, you know, their stock runs for a couple of days and then news comes later. Oh, it's kind of funny. We don't do that because of my last company. You know, when we sold when we sold it, the BC Securities Commission, the Ontario Commission, the Quebec Commission and the stock exchange asked for copies of all texts, phone numbers and emails because it looked like there was some people that were trading it before we made the announcement. And I think they were, but definitely not from my side because I didn't tell them until the last minute. So I just assumed, you know what, uh, as, as much as the shareholders, if they want to try and figure out uh, like a Pavlovian response, here comes a new sell. Well, no one's known ahead of time. So it's just, those is one of the things. So it's much easier that way, right? And and obviously being the Tellurium company, the only one, um, you know, obviously big companies and or big funds, of na national origin, uh, origin, you know, they call us up to talk about, hey, you want to find me? And, and I think I might be one of the few juniors to say no to them. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, I, I, why would I want to turn over a company and give you 35%, not including the warrants to to move something along? I mean, we know once we finish drilling, we know what we have. And you know, anytime you get a copper porphyry, uh, you're sitting there very, very good. So uh, again, I don't plan on being here for another 10 years. I think my wife's in the other room. She's probably glad to hear that. But we know that, you know, a couple of years from uh, doing some work and, and we'll have something really, really big. And just to put a, a, a finer point on it, John, is that, you know, uh, I think, uh, we, well, I think we put out usually, I think it was January, that we bought our own drill so that we could cut down right. our costs and all that. And the people in the, that we bought it from Alaska was sitting on the pebble brand new and they uh, insisted on getting shares of our company, not cash. Because the driller who walked the property looking for it, he was the one to say, hey, you got Bornite all over the place here. And so he told them. And and so we we gave them uh, shares. I think it was like 22 and a half cents or 23 and a half cents when the market was a little bit better. 
And then, uh, you know, we plan on having a second drill available for next year. And my gut feeling is it'll probably be paid for with shares as well. So we'll have two drills next year, just going crazy and we'll see what happens. So that's the one risk that some of these companies are looking at and say, well, let's see what they do. Well, they're gonna, I, I imagine there'll be a number of companies lined up. And just to put a, a finer point on it, when I said we sold Quinto, that was based on two drill holes and two drill holes only. Wow. There I didn't 500, know that. Yeah, they're uh, 500 meters apart, and they went down 900 feet or 300 meters into iron ore on both sides, proved there was something there, and that was it. Because, you know, had I kept drilling and drilling, then they worried, oh, does someone else come in? And But then I'd have to raise more money for all that drilling, so it kind of made sense, you know, semi-retire and move on. And, you know, I'm, I'm involved as a shareholder, a couple other solar companies and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm quite pleased. I'm, I'm, uh, and I don't go to bed at night dreaming of uh, rock formations and assays like some guys like if an opportunity comes, you say, okay, let's move it on. Cause you know, I have access to some other opportunities. You say, okay, well, let's take that money and go there, but we're not going to give it away cheap. And I think that's what bothers some of these big boys. Like who the heck does he think he is? Say, well, I know what, what we got, what we're sitting on. So. You know. Yeah. Well, you're in a unique position. There's, as you mentioned, one publicly traded junior in, in Tellurium and you're it. So yeah. if you were one of 300 copper juniors, it's a different story. Right. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think it's great that you're holding the line because I think more CEOs should do that. Uh, I'm a big advocate for the sector, as you know, and when I see these 9.9% deals being given away cheaply, it then imputes a certain valuation of your overall company, right? And so yeah. um, I won't name names, but there's plenty of those uh, that have happened over the last three years since the highs were made in the August, you know, maybe August of 2020 time period. So just mentioning you, you, you said four different people on the board um, worked at First Solar. So how did that happen, on, right? On the like that's the board. biggest advisor. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, what, what happened is that, um, and this is why I say you got to be uh, better to be lucky than good. So we talked about this phenomenal property we have in British Columbia with all these minerals on there. As a matter of fact, I say, if I wasn't worried about getting sued by Disney or whoever the other big uh, entertainment company is, I, I call ourselves Magic Mountain. I'm not sure who, if it's uh, Huckle, uh, Knox, Knox Farm or whatever it is. but sure. um, And then uh, First Solar went themselves and starting in 2006, they had a three-year expedition program going around the world looking for potential supplies of tellurium. Obviously, they need it. And in North America alone, they looked at over 200 properties. And they obviously focused in on the Klondike because the, the grades are just so spectacular. It's good. Anyway, so they did all their permitting, getting ready to drill, and then they dropped the property. So all the naysayers say, oh, my God, that doesn't make sense. If it was so good, why would they drop it? So then you got to tell them the, the reason why, because there's always a reason why. But, you know, people are, are used to being a bit jaundiced. Oh, uh, people know more than everyone. So if people drop it, it can't be any good. Not at all. And here's what happened. I've been told in, a, in an annual general meeting, I think it was 2011, a couple of uh, large investors stood up at the annual general meeting of First Solar and said to their board of directors, we think you're a bunch of hypocrites. You claim to be a quote unquote green company, but you're involved in the dirty world of mining. How do you okay. square that circuit, uh, circle? So make a long story short, they decided shortly thereafter that they would continue to buy their tellurium off the market and cost an extra one or two pennies per solar panel, but they could keep their chest out and chin up and go from there. So they sold their project, their property to their head of exploration, uh, their geologist who formed the company with his friends and family, bought it from them. And then he approached me uh, originally six years ago, and then um, we didn't cut a deal there. And I wish him the best of luck. And then he contacted me about three years ago. And I said, oh, I thought you were auctioning with someone else. Because, well, you know, we did our research. You're the only game in town. I said, well, yeah, I kind of knew that. So make a long story short, they got involved. So there are two gentlemen, um, the geologist worked for First Solar. And then their land package man uh, worked with First Solar. He knows all these uh, property owners around the world. And then uh, their um, vice president, who was in charge of uh, metallurgy of the minor metals. So we got those four guys, uh, you know, advising us on uh, how we move forward with the solar industry. But I should say uh, that, you know, you look at my board of directors, Matt Wayreinen, who was a director of mine with Quinto. He's a, he's the president of Solar Flow Through out of uh, on Toronto. I think they've got close to 100 separate uh, solar uh, infrastructures going in place in Ontario and they're growing. So uh, we do know a little bit about uh, about the solar industry. And uh, so, you know, I'd like to surround myself with really bright people. That's great. I mean, uh, thinking about the timing of that annual meeting in 2011, if I'm 
remembering correctly, Obama was in office uh, and he was obviously pounding the table on solar um, for solar being the biggest name. <laughs> so yeah. so obviously, you know, there was some pressure there. And, and I do agree with you. Uh, we invested in FPX Nickel, for example, at 10 cents US back in the end of 2019, because I went to the CEO and I said, what happened here? How did you get this property? so cheaply. And he said Cleveland Cliffs was in a similar situation. They were getting out of the nickel business at that time and they bid for it and got it. And it does happen a lot of times where larger but companies it, just yeah. don't, for whatever reason, want to continue down that path and want to narrow their focus. And that yeah. presents a great opportunity for someone like them and you. So, yeah, well, I, I didn't, I didn't know that about, about Cleveland Cliffs, but going back to Quinto, for, to the guys that bought out, I was out getting bought out for 4.5 billion, 4.9 billion. That was Cleveland Cliffs that bought them out, and they ended up basically just uh, tossing away the iron ore properties in Quebec. They overpaid and the trouble. So I, yeah. I didn't know that story. So it's very interesting. Yeah. You know, so, yep. so um, in, in summary here, because we've got a few more minutes, um, you've got two properties. One, Deerhorn just had the news, um, yeah. and that's in uh, BC. And then you've got Klondike in Colorado. Yes. Um, Tell us a little bit about Colorado because, you know, we know a lot about Nevada and, and you know, Idaho is good jurisdictions in the U S what do you think of Colorado? Uh, we love Colorado uh, and the area around I mean, is surrounded by all big mines historical and some are still in production. So we were actually told that we could probably do work there 12 months of the year, but we sort of said, well, let's just count on 10 months and all that, which is the difference with um, Deerhorn. We have about a three and a half month window for exploration because we're up a mountain. Right. right. So that's why we concentrate on that in the summertime. And then hopefully later this fall, but more likely next winter, we'll go down and do some work on in Colorado and go from there. But in the meantime, for, for the shareholders that are the people that are watching, they should go on our website because what we're talking about is just, you know, 50, 60 percent of what our company is. I mean, uh, you know, we were involved with a project called Salmon Gold. Uh, with, we own 49% of our First Nations uh, mining company called Chiona Metals. And we work with placer miners in Canada. First one was in Yukon. And we sell the gold that they're pla the placer miners to two U.S. corporations at a premium. And then that premium is put back in to rehabilitate the streams and the rivers and so on. Reintroduce salmon there and no one's allowed to mine it again. And the two companies in the U.S. that buy the gold at a, pr at a premium are Tiffany & Company, the big jewelry store, and Apple. So wow. we, right. we put that out in, uh, I think it was uh, just before the pandemic. We announced that in, in uh, August of 2019. And a couple of investors or chair phoned up and said, Mr. Doc, is this true? Are you, are you just blowing smoke? I said, look, as I say with everything, don't believe a word I say. Go on the Apple website right now, slash in Salmon Gold, and you'll see in the middle of their of their brochure, our First Nations partner, Alan Nadzerza, standing over the Yukon River in the Apple brochure. <laughs> I said, so uh, it took like three and a half months for Apple to approve uh, allowing us into the project. Because let's face it, junior companies, sometimes uh, they have a reputation being run by cowboys and Yahoo. So they had to check on who we were. And and that's been good. So we don't stand on the corner flouting and say, hey, look at us, as some companies would. It's just who we are. But our, our relationship with the First Nations are phenomenal. Thanks to my, my yeah. chairman, Tony, who's uh, not only a top geological lawyer, but he's also, if he's not the number one, First Nations lawyer in British Columbia is in the top two. And it's because of his gravitas, we, all these things are opening up for us. So some of the things that we'll be looking at in the future when we have the time and money is that uh, some of the First Nations are, you know, approach us and say, hey, we have some interesting uh, minerals in our in our area here that uh, if we're going to invite people in, we like first Tellurium to come in first if you have the time to look at it because we trust you guys. So we don't have the time right now, but hopefully next year. But that's just sort of the gravitas that we built. And if this ends up being like a huge opportunity, much bigger than what we can afford, then at least we can form a partnership with them and then call the big boys in Australia, whether it's Rio or BHP, and say, hey, look, here's some opportunities here in northern BC, Yukon, Northwest Territories, whatever it is, would you like to get involved? You know, But that's one of the advantages we have by being the First Nations really like how we're doing it. It didn't come by accident because of Tony... And his relationship for 35 years. So you surround yourself with good people, good things happen. Absolutely. Um, and that First Nations um, piece that you just mentioned is critical right now. I mean, 
for those of you that are listening uh, and following the news in a jurisdiction like Canada, it, it has really been um, somewhat of a challenge, I'd say, in 2022 and 2023, post-COVID, I find even more so um, in terms of getting things permitted, getting things looked at even because of just general delays. So to have that relationship, I think, really matters. Um, in summary, I, I bought the stock first. It, it, you know, I'm a U.S. buyer, so I'm buying the FSTTF ticker. And I bought that at nine cents and we just, you know, doubled our position at seven here. So I just want to point out to people that, you know, when you buy something, you know, 20 percent higher, you know, the idea is to buy it again. Like, I mean, you heard Ty, he's buying it over and over again. So that's what successful people do, in my opinion. It's a major flaw in our sector where a lot of newsletter writers and PMs buy one position, right? Maybe two. And then they forget about it. And it's like you can't abandon the name if you have conviction in what that company is doing. The thesis is still intact. You buy it again and again. And that's, you know, how we've made money in our portfolio over time is, is you know, dollar cost averaging down or lowering your cost basis, however you want to word it. So um, I really appreciate you coming on, Ty, and, and sharing the, the vision. Um, maybe just the last thing, uh, we have like maybe two, three minutes. Can you just give us a little bit of what is coming for next year and what we can expect to see? Yeah, well, coming soon is that uh, we have, uh, I mentioned we own 51% the of a thermoelectric company, then the other 49% is owned by a, uh, an engineer in Florida that's got an uh, invention he's right. working on. Uh, and the reason he called us is that the majority of his invention involves uh, tellurium. So he was Googling who's got tellurium, so he approached us and he's been watching us on YouTube for a year just to make comfortable how he likes how we do things. So I'm expecting that prototype, uh, hopefully within a week or two weeks, we're going to file the patent then, and uh, I'll either get him to make an introduction via Zoom or probably bring him to Vancouver. So we're going to have a room full of some investors that sit there and they can pepper him with some questions because obviously it could be game changing to say the least, you know. And then the other yeah. thing, which I th which I think you're, you're, the audience should understand is that because we have so many opportunities available to, I, I don't tend to sit there and t say everything at once because they end up looking like. Uh, like a huckster on the corner saying, who wants tungsten, who wants gold, who wants copper, who wants tellurium? And so there's some other opportunities, which we, I'm going to focus on soon. I'm going to do a, a, a president's message in the not too distant future. and Just say to people, look, here's what we understand about some of the uses of tellurium that people are researching. Do with it what you will, you know, because it's quite stunning. Yeah. And two, two of them involved uh, the medical the, the medical world. One of them, a company called Q-Rons. I don't know if they're public or private, but they said about... Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that uh, the tellurium can, uh, can be a cure for sepsis and antimicrobial bacteria. But more importantly, John, something that I've been following for probably a year and a half is a PhD from originally from Spain who moved to a Northeastern University in Boston and with a number of other uh, PhDs has filed, uh, I believe a patent, certainly filed their work that uh, they say that uh, tellurium nanowires, which is either wrapped up in platinum or palladium, depending on what the price of those two metals are, um, can um, heal melanoma. Now, it's not me saying it, but I, there's a YouTube of her, and it was a little over um, an hour going mm -hmm. through it, and it shows the slides, but here's the, here's the cancer cell after 24 hours, after 48 hours, and it's basically gone after 72. So her name, for people that want to check, is Dr. First name is Ada, E-D-A. Middle name is Vernet. And I think it's V-E-R-N-E-T, but it might be two T's and an E, but anyway. And the last name is Krua, C-R-U-A. And okay. it's got all the PhDs that are working on it. So again, you have to understand, we got so much going forward. But I think for people that are trying to figure out what the future of tellurium is, is it going to be for the solar panels, the batteries, for the thermoelectric, or a medical application? If we're one of the few that has it, like you said, you know, if we were one of 300 copper companies or one of four dozen graphite, cobalt, lithium, whatever the thing is, that's great. We're, we're it. So anyone that needs it, I think comfortable, at worst case scenario, they'll knock on the door. And the next time we can talk about all the incentives that the Department of Energy in the U.S. are putting out there for batteries and solar panels, as well as uh, the Department of Defense that could be interested in, in, in batteries. So we haven't had time. I appreciate all the time you'd give me, but there's so much behind yeah. this thing that uh, I'd love to do this again. Absolutely, Ty. We'll do it again. Uh, for those uh, that want to contact me or ask any questions, my contact info is going to be 
in the uh, show notes. My email directly is john.fenick, F-E-N-E-C-K at yahoo.com. And uh, thanks a lot, Ty, for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good day, everyone.